So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tony Hack from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Tony? Thank you. Well, what a pleasure it is to be here today. I certainly want to thank everyone involved with the Huffines Institute for the invitation. So the title of my talk is Exercise, Too Much of a Good Thing, and I have framed that in the context of a question because I want to cast some doubt on this idea that perhaps everything about exercise is good. Now, saying that, I'm a lifelong exerciser, former collegiate athlete, and I do believe in the health benefits of exercise. But my research career has focused on some of the bad things that exercise can do for you, in particular in relation to the endocrine system. And so today, I'm going to talk about one aspect of that work, and that's in the reproductive health of men. Now, I will tell you, sometimes doing work that says exercise can be bad for you makes me feel like this fish trying to swim upstream with all the wonderful evidence of how good exercise is. And occasionally, my work has not been well received by my colleagues or the media. I hope you will keep an open mind today on what I'm going to talk about. So how does someone get into a research career focusing on the bad things of exercise? Well, for me, it began in 1979 when I started my graduate studies. And I learned about what is called the athletic amenorrhea condition. I was just completely blown away by the idea that exercise could cause a problem with your health. In this particular case, menstrual dysfunctions in women that result in reduced sex hormone levels, reduced ability uh, or fertility, lower bone mineral content, increased risk for injury, decreased performance capacity. I had never heard of anything like this, and as a graduate student, it really made a big impact on me, and it became an area where I wanted to take a look and perhaps pursue some of my research work. Now, one of the things that came to me as I was learning more about this condition and occurrence in women, I started to think about, well, what about men? We know that exercise has positive adaptive benefits in both men and women. What about this negative effect on reproductive function in women? Do we see the same thing in men? Why would there be a gender-specific effect for negative aspects. And in the context of looking at the reproductive system, most certainly men and women have differences, but they have a great deal of commonality in the regulatory aspects at the brain and with some of the peripheral endocrine glands that are involved. So this led me to basically think about what about exercising men and reproductive dysfunction? Well, I was very fortunate in that I had a wonderful endocrinology professor when I was doing my medical school rotation, and I asked him one day, so if we have athletic amenorrhea in women, what is occurring in men? And his response was, the male reproductive system is robust enough to tolerate the stress of exercise training, which I thought was a really not great answer. And I pursued it with him, and said, I just really have a hard time believing this idea of gender-specific negativity, and so to speak, in the adaptation. And finally, he said, OK. So the real answer is, I don't know. Why in the heck don't you go find out and tell me? That started a research career and focus, where I said, I want to go answer this question and find out, are men affected like women relative to the reproductive system. I will tell you, too, I don't think he used the word heck, but I thought I'd clean it up for today. So I did my first study. And in that first study, it was a cross-sectional study where I took lots of different athletes that were involved in different types of training, marathon runners, sprinters, middle distance runners, wrestlers, strength athletes that were involved in track and field events, and I matched them up with a group of sedentary but healthy males that were of comparable age. And what I found was in the people involved with endurance exercise training, the middle distance runners, the marathoners, 
they had low resting levels of testosterone. Now, in women with amenorrhea, we see low levels of estrogen and progesterone, the males, uh, female sex hormones. Here was the corollary in looking at the major male sex hormone. And so I thought, well, this is pretty cool. It kind of matches up with what we are seeing in the women who have athletic amenorrhea. Well, like any good scientist, and I was trained by some very good scientists, never believe your own data. So I said, I need to go back and replicate this. So I did another study, and in that particular study, I did a larger sampling of individuals focusing on endurance training activity, because that's where we saw the lower testosterone, and we do see a high prevalence of amenorrhea in women who are involved in endurance activities, matched up the men with sedentary controls, and again, low testosterone relative to the age compared males. And this is resting levels of testosterone, not a function of the fact they had just exercised. So at this point, started publishing this data, and people said, well, you know what, maybe it's due to some kind of lingering residual exhaustion from their training. Maybe it's due to low energy availability, which is a fancy way of saying they weren't eating enough, which are both conditions that will cause your testosterone to be lower. So I said, fine, valid criticisms. Let's go look at another study. Again, low testosterone. Then people said, well, maybe it's a sampling frequency. You're only looking at a single blood sample in the course of a day and comparing. You should be looking at over weeks and months. So I did that, low testosterone. Then they said, well, maybe it's an, uh, an artifact of you're only doing a sample a day. If you were sampling over several hours in the course of a day, you might see that that wasn't there. Well, we still found low testosterone when we addressed that criticism. And by this point in time, other individuals are replicating our work and showing low testosterone. Now, we were feeling pretty good. One of the things we were also seeing in that line of work was luteinizing hormone was not elevated. Now, one of the things you find in men, if testosterone goes down, luteinizing hormone will elevate in an attempt to facilitate production of more testosterone. That was not occurring. And clinically, that's referred to as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which is way too long of a term to deal with. So our research group changed it to be much more exercise specific and called it the exercise hypogonadal male condition, which has been a term that has fixed in the literature. Now I will admit it does not roll off the tongue as well as athletic amenorrhea, but it's stuck and it is what it is. Well, I will tell you, back in the day when we started this work, we had something called newspapers, and the newspapers just had a field day with this work. Exercise running is going to make you sterile. Exercise running is going to ruin your sex life. Exercise runners have no testosterone. Well, I will tell you that I took a lot of hits for that, and I even got condolence cards from colleagues in the field. Dear Tony, so sorry that the, the newspapers are writing up your research. Well, one of the questions people always ask is, if this occurs and we're seeing low testosterone, how low is it? Well, we've done work that suggests that if you're an endurance trained athlete and you have been chronically training for 10, 15, and 20 years, which can occur, you're going to have a 30 to 35% reduction in your testosterone level compared to someone who is not an endurance athlete and a male. How prevalent? Well, it appears that about 25% of endurance trained individuals have this particular condition, and it seems to occur not only in just runners, but we see it in triathletes, we see it in cross-country skiers, anyone who's doing large volumes of endurance training. Well, why would this happen? Well, we wanted to look at some of the mechanisms, and one of the things we wanted to do is to look at the brain in these individuals, as well as the testicles, to try to find out what was going on and what we did is a series of studies where we injected drugs into individuals who had this particular condition, and we found that their brain is less responsive to signals telling it it should 
be trying to upregulate the production of testosterone, and the testicles themselves are less responsive in, to stimuli to produce testosterone. So there was some kind of training adaptation both at the what we would call the central and the peripheral aspects of regula uh, regulation of the reproductive system. Well, are there consequences? Well, one of the things you want to take a look at is fertility. And again, in athletic amenorrhea, we know they have lower fertility rates. Work that I've done, Mary Jane D'Souza's done at Pennsylvania, as well as uh, Diana Vamonde in Spain have shown that men with this condition, they have lower number of sperm, the sperm that they have are abnormally shaped, and the sperm that they have have low motility. Basically, what you find is, as someone uh, uh, summarized, these may be endurance athletes or good runners, their sperm aren't very good swimmers. Low bone mineral density occurs in these individuals. Not to the severity of what we see in some of the women with a amenorrhea, but most certainly there is a lower bone mineral content. Libido. That's an important issue relative to uh, the idea of fertility, and we find that men who are involved in large volumes of training for long periods of time, in particular if there's components of it that are high intensity, they have lower libido. So most certainly that's going to affect the potential for conception. Now, consequences, we tend to think of that as being negative. Might there be something in this that's positive? Well, I put forth the idea that perhaps in these endurance athletes we're seeing low testosterone because we're having a resetting of how much muscle mass they need. For an endurance athlete, extra weight, whether it's muscle or fat, is extra weight and affects the efficiency of the cardiovascular system. So perhaps we're seeing lower testosterone so that they can have lower muscle mass since testosterone is such a critical regulator of anabolism in muscle. Our future research in this area, well, one of the things we're trying to take a look at is training history, and in particular relative to the prevalency. And we think that there may be some aspects of when did people start their endurance training. Pre-pubertal individuals seem to perhaps have a higher risk for developing the condition as opposed to people who started their training post-pubertal. That's still very preliminary and we're trying to work on teasing that out of the data. We're also looking at some aspects of genetics and epigenetics to try to find out if there may be either a hereditary component that puts people at risk or some type of environmental exposure behavioral aspect that puts them at greater risk. So my take home message before I run out of time, women and men are different. They both have reproductive dysfunctions that are associated with exercise and a great deal of commonality in aspects of that dysfunction and some of the consequences. But what I think the evidence points to is the male system takes more exercise exposure to be disrupted. Does that come back to my endocrine professor's remark about being robust? I think that's the wrong way to think of it. I think the female reproductive system is more complicated and because of the hormonal changes over the typical 28-day menstrual cycle, they have more opportunity to develop a dysfunction. Endurance athletes, should they do anything relative to issues of fertility? First of all, I think it's really important that we increase the awareness of the healthcare providers and endurance athletes that this condition exists. I think if you're an endurance trained male and you want to uh, have a family and conceive a child, you may need to have a full reproductive workup. And then there's always the question, should there be testosterone supplementation? I think that's a decision for a healthcare provider, but my personal opinion is no. I think training modifications should be utilized prior to trying to immediately go to testosterone supplementation. And concluding advice, students, be careful what questions you ask your professors. 
you never know what path it might set you on. I've been 30 years doing this because of that one question. And finally, I leave, and we'll stop with my acknowledgments. None of us get to where we are on our own. I was trained by very good scientists. These are the people who have made me a better person and a better professional. And every day, I'm thankful for them in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. You don't get away without some questions here. And I've been getting a bunch of them. So this is from uh, Austin, from Mike at UT. It's been suggested that lower sex hormone levels in men and women may be linked to the lower body fat levels of endurance athletes. Do you think it's more about low levels of body weight or a direct result of endurance training? That's a little bit of a chicken and egg um, scenario. Mm -hmm. I, I really think um, the Endurance training drives the endocrine profile, mm. and then that profile helps to shape that composition, all right? But again, I can perhaps find evidence that would say that absent of the training, if we could create that profile, we could create a certain body composition. But in this mm. particular case, I think it is the training that is dictating the endocrine profile that affects their composition. And as a result, they also lose weight. And as a result, they also <laughs> lose weight. Right. Um, did the non-endurance trained athletes see any change in their testosterone levels, perhaps an increase, or was there no change at all compared to a normal active individual? Okay. So one of the things you'll find is if you go in and try to have clinical references, what is normal for things such as hormones in the endocrine system, they are always based upon a sedentary population. Mm -hmm. And so in this particular case, all of our reference was always on a sedentary population. And we made certain that our comparative sedentaries were always in the clinical normal range. So they were healthy, they were not physically active in the context of doing training, but they were definitely normal hormonal levels. Excellent. One more question. Molly Welsh from Seattle University. Um, if male testosterone levels are pharmacologically restored in endurance athletes, is sperm shape and motility restored? Okay, so that work has only been done on a pilot basis. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems you run into is when you're doing pilot data and you only have a few subjects, you hate to make a lot of inference about that. Uh, the pilot data says maybe, all right? And one of the problems is if you take trained people and invoke these particular changes, then uh, typically you say, gee, I want to start giving you back some supplementation, and they start to see body composition changes that they don't necessarily like, mm -hmm. aka they start putting on mass, and even if it's muscle, they're not really willing to stay in the study. So what we've done with our pilot work is said, yes, maybe we can get the sperm aspects back to normal, but we haven't been able to have our subjects comply as well as we'd like. Adherence is always a problem, huh? Yes, it is. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Dr. Hackney for his talk today. <laughs> <laughs>